Okay. Uh, let's move on. Um, let me go back to my presentation. So there was a question that's been asked um, during the break, and I would like to maybe explain it a bit further. A country officially declared as a uh, candidate country, pre-accession strategy starts. When negotiation starts, accession process starts. One of them is pre-accession, the other one is accession. They say you're a candidate, pre-accession starts. When you are starting the accession negotiations, accession starts. Is that clear? Müzakere başladıktan sonra katılım başlıyor. Katılım süreci başlıyor. Müzakerelerden önce katılım öncesi. Adı üstünde pre-accession. And what's the difference? Uh, the legal framework is different. Uh, the funds that you can be using is different. In one of them, you start opening chapters, as we call it, accession chapters, and you negotiate those chapters. You do the negotiations through chapters. You have uh, chapters to negotiate for. So that's the difference. Uh, and I said that it was a facilitator or a catalyst uh, in terms of making things happen. And it's done through a legal dialogue, not only for Turkey, for every candidate country, it's done through a legal dialogue. So it's done through legal documents. It's a very technical process. It's technical, it's detailed. And whatever is being presented in the political scene, like when our president says, we don't really care about the EU, but on the background, the technical process still continues. There's one thing that the politicians are for saying certain things for domestic purposes or for international foreign policy purposes, but there is another thing that in the technical, in the background, the Secretary General was working before, now the EU Ministry is working still, and the related um, ministries, related departments are still working, and they still continue having relationship with Brussels, with the Commission, with the related field. So keep it in mind, the technical process is still continuing in the background. And it's done through the accession partnership documents, in 2001, 2003, 2006, and 2008. Why there are different documents? Because as the accession process moves forward and it's changing and transforming, different needs come arise. And maybe certain uh, priorities have been fulfilled, so they're not mentioned again, but there are new things that are necessary to be done. That's how it's done. Uh, the accession partnership documents are prepared by the EU. So these are the documents that are setting the roadmap for Turkey. The EU is saying that under the short-term priorities or the medium-term priorities, according to this, 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 this criteria, you have to do this and that. So these are the priorities for the EU that Turkey should do. It's like a letter, a wishing list, like the Santa Claus, like the descent of Santa Claus. Like, I want this, this, this to be done. So this is the list that's been done. It's like a roadmap. As a response, Turkey, as a, a candidate country, prepares a national program for the adoption of Turkey. It's a long document. It's like a huge document. It's quite big and uh, it's very detailed. And it's a response by, the, by Turkey, by related ministries, that they send their response to the EU, uh, EU ministry. And the EU ministry is the coordinator and they collect all of it and they prepare that um, the one main document. So collecting with the different ministries, they comply them all together and prepare that document as a response. And in different years, as you can say, in 2001, it was a response in 2001 with the uh, national program, in 2003, another one. And after 2006, 2008, we have uh, the 2009 uh, national program. And it tells in the national program which law or legislation has to be adopted, which one has to be changed. If there's a new legislation that needs to be adopted, that is also listed. If there has been any issues that relate to establishing a new institution, a new department, that's also listed. If there is a need for new personnel, new staff, that's listed. If there is training needs, technical needs, equipment needs, those are listed. And how they are going to be founding it. If they're be founding it from the EU sources or the Turkish sources, how much of it is going to be covered by the EU sources, how much of it is going to be covered by the Turkish national sources. Everything is explained in that uh, response document. So different priorities in that sense. So just because in the accession partnership document from the EU that a certain subject is a priority, 
it might be um, reflected differently in the national document. So sometimes the EU will respond back saying that, oh, the national, uh, national uh, program didn't necessarily reflect the uh, blah, blah, blah priority very well, this and that. Sometimes criticism can arise. And if you want to see all these documents, you can access them. Here we are. Uh, these are the katılım ortaklığı belgeleri. Both in Turkish and English you can find them. And different years you can see. Or um, if you go to the basic documents, here are the national, uh, national programs as well. You can see that as well. So you can also access them here. And every year, there's another thing maybe I should show you. Uh, here. And every year, by the European Commission, there is a progress report. The Commission evaluates your progress in terms of accession. So every year, there are going to be a, a regular report, re regular progress report that is published. And it's like a response document, what Turkey has done that year. Sometimes there are harsh criticisms, and sometimes it's highlighting the progress, and sometimes it's highlighting what needs to be still done, and what are the gaps or the weaknesses on that policy matter. So it, it, it tells both. It tells the progress, but sometimes it tells what needs to be done even further. So you can also have a look and access that too. Going back to the accession uh, process, so the political conditionality, the political aspect, which is necessary to be fulfilled, fulfilled um, to open accession negotiations, is a bit vague. It's a bit difficult. It's not very objective in that sense. It's very difficult to uh, to assess whether or not that has been fulfilled. But the, the a key conditionality, it's more technical, it's a legal aspect, so it's more concrete, it's much easier in that sense to be able to evaluate whether or not you fulfilled, <coughs> you fulfilled that criteria. There's one other thing that you have to keep in mind regarding the political criteria, it's not static. Just because Turkey has fulfilled the accession criteria doesn't necessarily, the political criteria doesn't mean that it's done, it's finished. It's a continuous process that it has been constantly monitored. Even when you enter the EU, that monitoring continues. Whether you stay, whether you still stay in the same tract in terms of being democratic, respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, rule of law, freedom of expression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> so, candidates who already are in the EU are still being monitored. And in Turkey's case, when the accession negotiation started, an accession negotiation <coughs> framework document was accepted. And in that framework document, negotiations framework, <coughs> I lost my voice finally, it said that there is a suspension clause for Turkey. In that suspension clause, it says that just in case that Turkey might be diverting from the track of democracy, there is a possibility that accession negotiations can be suspended. This was like a safeguard clause um, in, in a certain way. The safeguard clause that just in case something dramatic happens in Turkey, that the EU is basically uh, safeguarding itself. It means that, that the accession negotiations can be uh, suspended. That, that, that can, kind of gives a leverage to the EU. That was the first time the EU has uh, come up with that creative uh, idea to have a suspension clause. It started with Turkey. Uh, but as I said, the EU accession, the EU enlargement has been a process that evolved over time. And according to the needs and according to the candidate countries that are trying to become members, they are changing the, the enlargement process as well. So it's also becoming more technical, more complex, more sophisticated, and maybe more difficult in that sense. <clears throat> so in the, huh, that was one other thing that was critical, the Cyprus issue. As you know, in 2004, uh, there has been a referendum conducted in Cyprus whether the Annan plan should be accepted or not. And in that um, referendum, the Turkish uh, part uh, said, 
yes, with a high percentage, uh, while the Greek Cypriot said no, with a high percentage. And so, uh, despite this um, dispute, despite the, the lack of uh, an agreement on the, on, the, on the situation of the island, the island joined as a divided island. And it was, a, it was an important um, political decision at that time for the EU accession. And it became quite problematic because afterwards, as Cyprus became a member state, it becomes a bit more difficult to solve the issue uh, uh, right now. Uh, in 2004, the regular progress report uh, prepared by the European Commission noted that um, according to the, the criteria that they, they, uh, they looked into and monitored, uh, that Turkey was said to have fulfilled the political criteria and was recommended to begin the negotiations. And in 2005, uh, in the summit meeting uh, of the EU heads of states and governments, it was stated that Turkey has sufficiently implemented the political criteria and it can open the accession negotiations by 3rd of October 2005. And this is when um, it started. First, Ali Babalajan, the state minister, was appointed as the chief negotiator of Turkey in the EU accession, uh, in the EU accession negotiations. Then Egeman Bosch became the chief negotiator. And now it's Volkan Bosker, who is the chief nego 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 negotiator and at the same time the EU minister. Um, and they have a negotiation fragment document, as I mentioned previously. And they started uh, the accession negotiations. Here is a list of accession negotiations, as you can see. In the Eastern enlargement, there were about 31 chapters that were negotiated. The reason why it's important to divide it into chapters is because as the Aki, the Aki communitaire, is so complicated and detailed and there's a, there's a huge um, list of Aki that has to be adopted, it's been uh, assumed that it's much easier if you divide it into chapters, d depending on the policy areas, it's much easier to negotiate chapter by chapter. In the Turkish case, there are more chapters. Some of the chapters has been divided and became, for example, the cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs became justice, freedom and security and judiciary and fundamental rights. So they, they divided certain chapters into subsections and they become more chapters in that regard. Now Turkey has 35 chapters. Any ideas how many chapters that has been open for negotiation and uh, provisionally closed? One. one. Which one is that? Um, science and technology. Science and technology was open for negotiations and the same date it has been uh, closed, provisionally closed. That's also important, it's provisionally closed. What does provisionally closed mean? It means that there might be other types of acquis that, has de that can be developed on that, uh, in that chapter area, or certain changes can happen in, the, in terms of in the political scene and this and that. So the EU can ask to reopen that chapter. So just because it means that you close a chapter doesn't mean that it's been closed. Until you become a member state, it is going to be a provisionally closed chapter. So it can be reopened again at some point in time in life etc so there's only one chapter that has been opened and provisionally closed and it's the science and research one here uh, that has been opened and closed any ideas how many other chapters that has been opened or closed and what is the situation of the negotiations around that so one chapter that has been, like it started in 2005, we are nearly in 2015 almost. So in the last 10 years, we were able to open and provisionally close one chapter. So you do the maths, we have 35 other chapters, how many years we need to, uh, to complete this accession process. And even if we complete this accession process, whether or not we will become a member state is a different issue because there's the absorption capacity criteria as well. So it's slightly complicated. So in order to see the more updated list, let's have a look <coughs> from the ministry's website, uh, the current situation in the accession negotiations. So science and research is opened and provisionally closed. As you can see, it also says that provisionally closed. And there are some open chapters, such as free movement of capital, company law, intellectual property law, information society and media, food safety, veterinary and uh, sanitary policy, taxation, statistics, enterprise and industrial policy, trans-European networks, regional policy, 
uh, and coordination of structural instruments, environment, consumer and health protection and financial controls to be opened, economic and monetary policy and education and culture, screening reports approved at the Council of the European Union with benchmarks. Hmm. So that's the other thing, the screening process. What does the screening process mean? Then the screening process <coughs> it's looked at the national legislation and the, uh, the EU legislation, and a screening report has been prepared. So what are the co uh, gaps or the conflicts between the national versus the EU legislation, and what has to be changed? So you basically see what is out there in terms of the EU, in terms of Turkey. So that's why the screening part is quite critical and important. Uh, and there are certain ones that are actually a bit more problematic than the other ones. Uh, let me show you. Mm, that finishes over here. Um, hmm. There are some issues that are very problematic. That's uh, certain uh, certain uh, chapters has been blocked by first the Sarkozy uh, effect, as we called it. And the French effect, the Sarkozy effect, and later on with the Cyprus issue, the Cyprus effect. Basically, it was related to the areas that uh, was dealing with the customs union, because um, as part of the as a as a country that is part of the customs union, you should be allowing uh, the goods and uh, goods that are arriving from the customs union area of the EU to arrive to Turkey. But in the case of the Cyprus issue, because Turkey doesn't recognize the Greek uh, Cypriot uh, part. Uh, any kind of plane that is departing from um, the, the Greek Cypriot airports or from the ports uh, that carrying the goods and they are trying to come to the Turkish ports or the airports, it becomes an issue. Uh, Turkey says that they are coming from an un, un, undocumented or unrecognized territory, so they cannot necessarily come and board or land uh, and use the ports, and it becomes a tension uh, issue. And the EU is then claiming that Turkey is not fulfilling its obligations that is arising from the customs union agreement. And it becomes a, a huge issue of um, conflict and certain chapters has been blocked accordingly until Turkey is allowing to open its ports and uh, airports uh, to the vehicles that are uh, basically uh, originating from the Greek Cypriot uh, part. But as you can see, um, this technical process behind the scenes in that sense, behind the um, outside the ministry uh, or ministerial level or the presidential level or the prime minister level, at the technical level, the accession process continues. It's the technical process continues at basically at the legal level. What is that legal level? The key adoption level, adopting the key. Um, there are, how it's done is that it's done through EU projects, like the twinning projects. In the twinning projects, experts from the EU come to Turkey and they try to see how in a certain project, in a certain policy area, how things are done in Turkey and how it can be um, basically adapted to the EU style or EU way of doing things and how the roadmaps can be prepared. And that sort of has been done in different policy areas at different levels, at the different ministerial levels. People from the EU come and uh, visit their Turkish counterparts at their ministries. Same thing happens. Different, at different ministries, people will go and uh, they will be meeting at Brussels uh, with their counterparts. Uh, there will be uh, scholarship programs like the Jean Monnet scholarship programs. Uh, uh, where they will try to send people abroad into the EU a member state so that these people will be educated on EU and then when they come back to Turkey they will either be working at the public level or the private level or at the university level working on EU related things. So trying to establish those links basically. So there are different like there will be funding for example NGOs trying to empower NGOs, civil society uh, or the Erasmus program for you guys. How many of you have been to an Erasmus exchange program? Not much actually. The rest didn't go, that's surprising. Uh, all the kismet uh, English. But at least, uh, I don't know which countries you've been to. Italy. Italy. UK. UK. Germany. Germany. Poland. 
Poland, Poland, Polish uh, loving side. How was Poland? As they're not very positive towards Turkey's accession to the EU, I hope that you were able to persuade at least some young minds uh, that Turkey is the most wonderful country in the world. Um, uh, so that's the Erasmus programs is also trying to create like um, an epistemic community in the sense that EU-minded people who travel have experience. You give your experience, you take the experience. You know po about Poland, you know about UK, or you don't. You know about uh, Italy. I, there's somebody who was from Italy, right? Uh, who went to Italy? Uh, so you have an experience, and not only that, you go there in terms of learning from them but also you're showing your culture, your experience as a, as a person from Turkey as well. I mean, it's the same thing for other countries as well within the European Union too. So this is exchanging uh, ideas, policies, this and that. So this is going on that level as well. Let's go back in the more technical side. So maybe you can have a look and then see that the progress has been a bit slow in terms of opening, uh, 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 the, opening the chapters. Not many chapters has been opened and not many chapters has been closed so far. And in the, in the internal coordination, that's our guest was going to be talking about this today because she was the head of that section in the EU ministry. Uh, but there's an internal coordination and harmonization committee. There's uh, one also at the, at the, uh, at the parliament, Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi AB Uyum Komisyonu. Böyle bir komisyon da var. Farklı partilerden temsilcilerin bir araya geldi. And what does, uh, what does the, uh, the Internet Coordination Harmonization Committee do is, first of all, they coordinate, monitor and evaluate all the efforts of the public organization, that's all the public institutions that are involved and agencies in the framework of their functions. They also uh, study, access and submit, whenever necessary, um, the proposals of public organizations and the agencies with respect to the harmonization of Turkish legislation and the EU acquis. And they set priorities and guiding efforts of concerning changes uh, with regards to the EU acquis. If you want to look at the chronology, you can also have a look at the chronology at the EU website. And uh, in, the, in the literature, just to give you a general idea, this, is, this transformation has been referred as Europeanization, Arpalashmak. But not in this literal sense of Arpalashmak, it's a more technical and more restrictive sense of Europeanization I'm talking about. So the, the impact of basically the EU and the EU integration process at the domestic level. And it is done, as you can see, uh, mostly through the EU legislation adoption of the EU acquis. So at the very, very technical level that you're adopting the EU norms and you, EU um, values while adopting basically uh, the EU style of doing things through the adoption of the, uh, the EU acquis communautaire. Okay, this is the more technical part of the EU accession process. Any questions? <coughs> what I'm trying to, what I try to give here is that despite all the political downsides and this and that, at the end of the day, at the technical level, the EU accession process is still going on. But I'm not saying that the political developments do not change anything. It obviously does. How in 2000, and, uh, from 1999 till 2005, with the adoption of the uh, EU harmonization packages were quickly done because there was a target, open the accession negotiations. It was a period where it's called the golden period of Europeanization, basically. It was very quickly done. It, uh, it, there was an incredible willingness on the Turkish side to do things. But from 2005 onwards, we see a kind of a uh, reluctance of doing more stuff. And it can be argued for the different levels that Turkey was dealing with its own domestic problems during that time, that it was transforming itself, there were different crises that was going on, and it's called like um, 
when you interview that some people might say that if there was a reform fatigue, there's too much reforms at one going, it, Turkey needed to sit down and digest some of the reforms and see how they're being implemented. On the other side, from the European side, if you look at it, the EU was also going through various transformations uh, during that period. It just recently had an enlargement with uh, lots of members joining in and there is a diversity that's going on. At the same time, they were dealing with the Lisbon Treaty and adoption of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, and it was uh, argued that there was an enlargement fatigue on the EU side as well. So those things are coming together from both from the EU side that EU's domestic problems and EU's enlargement fatigue on the other side on the other side Turkey's internal problems and Turkey's maybe uh, reform fatigue joining together we see a stagnation from 2005 onwards from 2005 onwards unfortunately instead of increasing in the pace of adaptation and adoption and the EU accession process speeding up we see a uh, slowing down nearly uh, stopping basically nearly nearly coming to a halt of the EU accession process. So that's why there has been a, a, a new positive agenda as it's been called was brought into being. One of them uh, one of the one of the issues that was mentioned was the visa liberalization slash facilitation was also uh, was put in there trying to speed up things, trying to put some positive incentives for the for the uh, for Turkey to try to push for further reforms because as Turkey thought that this is a very costly process to move on and it's, there is no intention for the EU to enlarge any further because enlargement has no longer been in the priority for the EU's agenda either, that there is no need to push for further reforms. I mean, it's a, it's a politically costly project for sure and you have to have a strong willingness to continue with the reform process. And from the, this is from the Turkey side and from the EU side, because it's dealing with all these issues and the economic crisis, a country like Turkey joining in, who's not super willing to, to join anyways, becomes also a politically costly project to sell within the member states as well. So it's like a chicken and egg problem nowadays we're dealing with. It's a catch-2020 uh, uh, situation and it's like a vicious circle that is going on. And in order to break that vicious circle, the positive agenda was brought forward. So that maybe with certain smaller carrots and smaller goals rather than the membership goal, which is the eventual goal, which is like going to happen God knows when, uh, maybe these smaller goals will increase the incentive and maybe uh, people will be more willing to support the EU accession process. So that was the aim. And it shows that but if you look at the GMF surveys, the German Marshall Fund's trend surveys, it shows that in the last couple of years, there has been an increase in the support for EU uh, accession process in general. So it, it, people are seeing the EU accession process in a more positive way. Uh, you might argue that whether or not this is because of this or that, I mean, there has been an impact of the domestic situation as well for this support. It's a different question matter, but at the end of the day, although there has been a decline in the support for EU accession, there has been uh, an increase in the accession process. <laughs>